recording. All right. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Veronica. Veronica is an assistant professor in the Department of Mathematics at Duke University. Her research focuses on modeling, analyzing, and simulating intracellular transport and filament organization mechanisms. So today, she will tell us some of the related work about modeling and topological data analysis for biological ring channels. Thank you so much, Ying, for the introduction um, and for having me. Um, so yes, today I'll tell you a little bit about how tools from um, topological data analysis have been useful to a question in my research. Um, but before I get into that, I typically don't um, approach the problems I work on from an applied topology angle. So I wanted to tell you a little bit more about the kinds of problems and biological motivation uh, for my work. Um, and so as Ying said, I'm um, interested in intracellular transport. Um, I try to understand how inside cells proteins have to be very dynamic, they have to move around in order for that cell to function healthily and properly. Um, and so this video is kind of useful because it shows you some of the key players involved in transport inside cells. Um, you'll have cargo, so you can see some examples here. They could be proteins, RNA, or vesicles. In this video, you have actual vesicles uh, that are being transported. And sometimes these proteins have to be localized somewhere. They have to get to a, a specific compartment of the cell. Other times they have to be uniformly localized depending on their function. Um, and then you have the proteins that move these um, vesicles in this case. Uh, and these are molecular motor proteins that you might be familiar with. Um, and so these are of course fascinating in their own right to try to understand their movement. Um, and you know they do have, experiments have validated this kind of um, head over head movement that you're seeing here. And Finally, you have um, the cellular roads, so to speak, really the cytoskeleton of the cell, um, which are these protein polymers along which these motor proteins move to transport this cargo. And so I've been interested in trying to understand how transport occurs in the precise time and spatial scales that are observed in um, uh, cell scale data, um, and also in understanding how, despite the fact that you have all of these different players interacting with each other, so you have all sorts of binding, unbinding, or detachment um, uh, interactions here between them, uh, that leads to still robust large time behavior and organization inside the cell. So I'll focus a little bit today um, on uh, sort of cellular roads and how they get organized. Um, but to give you a, a flavor of these kinds of cellular roads inside the cell, there's a few main classes of them. Um, and all of these different classes basically exist at different scales and lead to interesting mathematical questions uh, all on their own. Um, so I have an example of a cell here, which is a neuron. So you can see its cell body, you can see its axon and its growth cone. Um, just just for visualization. It could be other types of cells as well. And so inside here, you see one of the first classes of uh, filaments or protein polymers inside the cell are these green lines here that are called microtubules. Um, and these are the largest in diameter and also the longest, um, so that uh, typically proteins that have to, you know, get all the way cell from the cell body to the growth cone that have to do this large range transport are typically transported along microtubules. Um, and so I've studied microtubules not in the neuron, but actually in um, the oocyte of um, a frog, uh, of the frog, so in egg cells of the frog. You can see an example here with the nucleus. Um, and I've uh, studied how these microtubules lead to robust transport of uh, messenger RNA, um, which is very important that it localizes at the periphery of the cell on a certain time scale. Um, so that was with collaborators at Brown University. University. And um, what this involved was um, a dynamical systems, especially partial differential equation kind of models where there was switching behavior between different kinds of dynamics, like diffusion, transport, and pausing behavior. Uh, and more recently, I've also approached that from a stochastic process point of view. Um, and a sort of intermediate uh, um, uh, scale of these filaments inside the scale, you have what's called intermediate filaments. Inside the neuron, these purple guys uh, represented here are actually called neurofilaments. Um, so I started neurofilaments with um, collaborators in neuroscience at Ohio State. And I started um, how 
they get transported along the axon. You can see them here fluoresce and moving along the axon. What's interesting about these intermediate filaments is that on the one hand, they are these polymers um, inside the cell. They're part of the cytoskeleton. But on the other hand, they really act as uh, cargo. So, so they're actually getting transported along the microtubules. And even more interesting, they tend to have these side arms, as you can see here, which basically means they take up space. And so if you have a lot of these neurofilaments at one location, along the axon that leads to a swelling in that axon. The axon increases its caliber at that location. Um, and while uh, and, and that is you know associated with a range of neurodegenerative diseases. So in, in this work we use stochastic modeling validated with um, photoactivation kind of experiments to try to understand how that doesn't happen in healthy axons. Axons, in particular because axons have these constrictions that are called nodes of Rambier, which could be potential bottlenecks for this axonal transport. And finally, what I'll tell you about today is the sort of smaller scale of uh, filaments inside a cell. Um, and these are called actin. And for whatever reason, here they're in red and here they're in green, but they're supposed to represent the same thing. Um, and so actin filaments are sort of the smallest, but that doesn't make them less important. Um, they can be found in different parts of the cell. You can see them here in the growth cone where they can lead to basically pushing that out, leading to growth. Um, they can organize into very interesting structures. They can organize into bundles in some situations, into asters. Um, they could be homogeneously distributed. Or the topic of today's talk, they can organize into these ring channels, these circular structures. And the way they do that is that they interact with a different kind of molecular motor protein, not exactly the one that you saw in the video, before, uh, but these are called myosin motors. And so um, these ring channels, really, uh, one can see them in a number of different biological systems uh, because they play critical roles in development, wound healing, and cell division. You have an example here of where they show up in development. So you see these yellowish green circles. Those are ring canals in the embryo of the fruit fly, and they basically allow for transport of nutrients and other materials between different chambers um, of that embryo. Uh, in wound healing, ring channels basically um, are formed again of actin and myosin interacting and contracting in to lead to closing in of that wound. Um, and you know, in cell division, you can see an example here of a ring channel again closing in and leading to division of that cell into two. Um, the kind of ring channels that we're motivated in, at, at least for the work I'm talking about today, are the ones that uh, don't contract in, but rather that can maintain precise diameters over a large time scale, and typically those we find in development. And so the specific, uh, and yeah, so here's an example again of um, the serine channel, which consists of actin interacting with myosin, which um, uh, basically contracts um, uh, the actin structures. So the specific biological motivation comes from the lab of Adriana Dawes at Ohio State. She's both in math and molecular genetics and actually has a wet lab where she studies the roundworm C. elegans, which is this very, very tiny worm. Um, and here you can see a cross section through C. elegans uh, with its reproductive system re uh, represented here. This is called a gonad. Um, and you can kind of see here a, a rectangle that's being um, zoomed into over here in these images. And so uh, the idea is that in the reproductive system, what happens in between these different membranes, there's going to be some germ cells that form in there. And those germ cells are going to have to um, you know, exchange material and nutrients with the rest of the worm body. And then as they grow, they get out of here, they go around the bend, and then they become these mature oocytes. Um, and, but the way that they are able to really mature is uh, they're exchanging nutrients and, and uh, the opening that allow for that transport to happen are uh, ring channels. So you can imagine looking at these membranes here and sort of looking up or looking down and you would see these openings uh, that correspond to ring channels. Um, what's kind of interesting here, and um, Adriana has validated in her lab, um, is the fact that the, it was believed that two types of motors, two types of myosin, two motors in particular, um, have been thought to um, influence this ring channel formation uh, and maintenance of um, this ring channel at a 
a pretty constant diameter. Uh, and they were also kind of, they're in the same family of myosin motors and they're kind of thought to be redundant for certain functions. Um, what they found here is, is not really that. Uh, so again, here you have half of that reproductive system represented here with the germ cells, these gray circles that then exchange um, uh, material with the cytoplasm of the worm. And this is what that would look like um, in a healthy um, organism. And this is what it looks like when they knock down with RNA interference, uh, either one of these two myosin two motors. So when they knock down one of them, they see this complete cellularization, which is very premature. Um, and in the other case, they see the complete lack of cellularization. Both of these are really bad, of course, for the development of the worm. Uh, but what this also shows is that these motors seem to somehow antagonize each other with respect to cellularization and main channel maintenance. Um, so some uh, ideas of how this might work out have come up in um, uh, Adriana's modeling work. Uh, but one of the things that's uh, kind of interesting about the system is that um, if they, so here they're kind of showing you the membranes inside the reproductive system. The actin itself is really hard to visualize in C. elegans. Um, you know, in some larger organisms that can be done. Um, somehow in, in the system, it, it turns out to be um, pretty toxic um, uh, for the worm. And so one cannot really see the dynamics of this ring channel formation um, in vivo. Um, and so, uh, we have set out to investigate this ring formation using agent-based models for the interactions of filaments and motors. Um, and what I'll tell you most about today is uh, develop methods to try to detect such ring structure formations in time series, either synthetic or experimental data. Although with experimental data, we're not quite there, but I will tell you some directions in future work. Um, and so, uh, well, and again, one of the motivation we have is trying to potentially understand what could be mechanistically different between these two motor proteins that were thought to be redundant before, but seem to really contribute in different ways to this ring channel opening. Um, so in terms of the simulation framework, this is something that we've collaborated with um, a computational chemistry lab at University of Maryland, the Papoyan Lab. They have this platform that's called Median, uh, and that's what we use for our purposes. Um, so Median uh, is, is nice for us because it's already parametrized for actin-myosin interactions. So you can see, for example, actin filaments here, myosin motors, but you also have a lot of other options for cross-linkers and other kinds of proteins. Um, and it typically consists of a chemical model where there's um, diffusion or transport of chemical species. And you can see their simulation domain is made up of these um, cubes. And so you can have stochastic jumps between these different um, uh, simulation compartments. Um, uh, and also, um, you know, they have polymerization and depolymerization dynamics of these actin filaments. And they also have a mechanical model, uh, which basically means how do they actually represent these actin filaments. Um, and it's basically a coarse grain model where each piece that makes up this actin filament is not quite a monomer, it's more like an elongated cylinder, and they have interaction potentials of how um, they stretch, how they bend, how they interact with motors, and so on. Um, and so this is going to be important for us, the fact that we actually have information from this um, synthetic data about locations of different of these uh, cylinders throughout an actin filament. Um, and so these two chemical and mechanical models are then coupled and then deciding what happens at the next time point is based on energy minimization. And so to give you an, an idea of what this looks like, um, here's an example median simulation with actin filaments, motors, and cross-linkers. Um, and so I've worked with Scott McKinley at Tulane um, and his very talented undergraduate students, Riley, um, to set it up for our problem. What would be um, sort of the domain size for us? What are the uh, interesting proteins that we want to look at? And Riley also has worked a lot, um, and we're continuing her work on trying to understand data analysis measures like contractility, of this cytoskeleton network that emerges, um, local alignment or filament length distributions, um, as well as motor localization as well. Um, so uh, focus 
focusing now on trying to understand this complex time series data, um, which is basically form of all of these filaments. How could we go about understanding ring structure in a rigorous way in such a data set? And so the idea to use topological data analysis came from some prior work um, of trying to use tools from um, topological data analysis to uh, apply them to such um, uh, data from a dynamical system. Uh, typically, uh, TDA and persistent homology are applied to a static data set, and it can give us insight about um, topological objects and structure in that data set. And that data set can be really highly dimensional, which is really a strength of this method. Um, in our case, we were interested in understanding formation of a ring channel through time or emergence of such a feature. And so because of that, we wanted to understand how can TDA basically interact with data from a dynamical system. And so these previous works um, have approached this in sort of different ways. Um, this, uh, this work by uh, Chad Topaz and Lori Zickelmeyer um, have uh, basically uh, addressed the idea of trying to understand how many features of a certain type, how many connected components you have through time in um, a data set, or how many holes or one dimensional features do you have through time, uh, which is a bit different from what we're interested in. And there's also more sophisticated sophisticated invariants that people are working on um, uh, as well. These, however, are not as interpretable. They don't have really real um, good uh, visualization. They have been mostly used for classification purposes. Um, so they're not quite, quite ready for the kind of application that we're working on. And so before I tell you how we use persistent homology in, in our work, I did want to have a few slides just to get everyone on the same page of the kind of persistent homology that I use in this work. Um, so taking sort of a step back, I'll explain to you how one gets a point cloud of data later, but imagine you have a discrete point cloud of data like you have here. Um, what, what, what I construct in this work um, are Viatoris rips complexes. And the way that that's done is we're going to grow these balls around these points with um, a small radius at first. And that, the radi that radius is called a proximity parameter. You can see it here on this axis as well. And so when that radius is really small, um, then what we're going to want to do is sort of get a sense of how many connected components we have in this data, how many loops. And right now, really, we don't have a lot of interesting things. We have as many clusters or connected components as there are points. And so that's what we're seeing in this barcode here corresponding to connected components, as many bars as there are points. Um, as we increase that proximity parameter, still nothing really has happened. But now we see that two of those balls intersect. And so so we draw an edge between those, and that means that this really has become one cluster instead of two. So one of these bars has ended because one of those connected components has ended at a certain value of the proximity parameter or of the radius around those points. And so we continue this process. You can see fewer and fewer bars uh, in this cluster um, component. And then we start seeing some more interesting things. You can see here a shaped triangle because everything here um, intersected all of those balls. Over here, you see an actual loop and you see another one here. So we basically have a hole. Um, again, we drew edges uh, whenever we have pairwise interactions between those two balls. Um, and so you can see now that two bars showed up in this loop or one dimensional hole um, uh, category corresponding to those two loops. And they started at a certain value of that proximity parameter, they're going to end at a different value. Um, so we continue that process. You can see those two holes are now filled in. A new one has formed, so we see another bar corresponding to that. And so we do that until there's not really that much interesting things to do. And so, of, of course, I will also mention one can do this for higher dimensions. So we can look at trapped volumes um, and look at their persistence over this scale parameter epsilon as well. Uh, one of the things that's going to be sort of important for the way that we use this in our work is um, this idea of the birth and death of a topological feature. So, for example, this corresponded to a one dimensional hole, and we started seeing it at a certain value of that radius epsilon that we're going to call birth radius. And we stop seeing it at this other value of epsilon that we're going to call death radius. Oftentimes in persistent homology, these two are just called birth and death times. But since we're going to add time as basically another dimension here, um, that, that gets a bit confusing. So we're going to refer to these as birth and death radii. 
Um, and so how does how do we get to a point cloud from the kind of um, agent based model that we work with? And so you have here a snapshot of a simulation with only five actin filaments from a median um, run. Um, and so that we're keeping it simple just for visualization purposes here. And so as you remember, we actually have a lot of information about these different cylinders that make up this actin filament. Uh, we have their location information in 3D. And so what one could do is we, one could sample all of those points or some of those points to get a point cloud. Just for visualization purposes, I flattened them into 2D, though we don't do that for the method. And also, I only extracted three points along each filament. We, again, don't do that in the method. And so that gives us a discrete point cloud. And so then we can do exactly what I've gone over in the previous slides, which is we can compute persistent homology of that point cloud. So you can see here, we're taking those balls of different radii around the points, and we're increasing that proximity parameters, and we're looking at various uh, topological objects that we can identify here. Um, one way to summarize this uh, persistent homology computation is with what's called a persistent diagram that you can see here, and that has been quite useful in our work. And so uh, here, what's happening is we're putting the birth radii of all of these features on the x-axis and the death radii on the y-axis. And you can see that all of the features here, these circles and triangles, are above the diagonal with slope 1, because if it's going to be a feature, its death radius better be larger than its birth radius. And so the other thing to note is that the connected components are these dark circles. Um, we don't focus them so much on them so much on um, our work. However, you note that these are all at uh, basically x equals zero because we saw those connected components forming at the very smallest um, uh, value of the proximity parameter and then ending at a different value. And then you have um, in this particular example two um, one dimensional hole that I represented here with this red triangle. One thing I will note, since this will come back again, um, is again, this persistent diagram representation is what we use. But also, um, if we look at these red triangles, which is what we're going to focus on, basically the one dimensional holes, um, and how do they emerge in this data set, um, these, uh, basically, the further away that these are from this diagonal, the more persistent they are. If you think back at that barcode representation, you basically saw a bar for um, a one dimensional loop or hole, um, and it was longer if it was persistent over a larger spatial scale of that proximity parameter. So uh, basically how far it is from the diagonal is sort of a marker of its significance. But that's that's not always the case. There could be significant features that are close to the diagonal for other applications. In our setting, since we're looking at the emergence of a global hole, um, then further away from the diagonal is more significant for our setting. All right. And so, of course, it, in more realistic simulations, we have um, uh, uh, more actin filaments. We have them interact with myosin motors and cross linkers. So we can see, and we also have different time snapshots of the simulation. We actually have this every 10 seconds. I'm just showing you here three time points to get a sense of how um, actin filament fills out space. Um, and uh, then what we can do is the same thing that I showed you in the previous slide with the framework, which is sample points along the actin filaments to get a sense of how actin fills out space. And so we see that corresponding to each time point. And then we can compute persistent homology for each of these point clouds. And we get a persistent diagram, which is a topological summary for each of those time points. So you can kind of see how there's really a lot of these um, red triangles, basically a lot of these one dimensional holes that we extract from this data. Many, many of them are very close to the diagonal as they really correspond to these very small features that might be hidden in here, for example. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to shift this a little bit. Um, and instead of having this birth to death representation, we wanted to get a sense of how would this look like if we actually put time on the x axis? How, how, what happens if we look at the dynamics through time of these features? And so what we're doing here is um, in these black circles, I'm going to represent the birth radii of all of the features. And in these red circles, the death radii of all of the features. So you can imagine this in the 
following way. At time equals zero here, I would have a certain act in my Austin organization from this um, stochastic model. I could extract the point cloud from that. I compute persistent homology and get this persistent diagram. And I do that at every point. And so what I'm doing here is I'm just taking the coordinates of these red triangles and marking them in black or red if they're birth or versus death. And one thing that's kind of striking here and motivated this work was the fact that there's a certain continuity to the emergence of some of these features, which perhaps makes sense because although we have a stochastic agent-based model, um, still things can't really jump from one compartment cube here to all the way on the diagonal further away. So there's a certain continuity to all of the dynamics, which seems to get reflected also in these topological features that we extract. So to exploit that, um, this is basically the result, uh, the output of the method that we propose. What you're going to see here is uh, a median simulation of act in interaction with myosin. Uh, so you're going to see different time points as it goes on as a video. And on the right hand side, you're going to see the persistent diagram. But instead of seeing all of the whole features, what you're going to see is the most significant one and how it changes through time, how it moves away or towards the diagonal through time. Um, and so let's take a look. You can see things start very, very close to the diagonal as more of an opening in the simulation domain forms. You can see the significant feature going further away from the diagonal and even further away from the diagonal. At some point, some uh, filaments are going to start going in. Um, there they are. Here's one here. And so you can see this path kind of going in closer to the diagonal. So it is something that's fairly sensitive to these outliers is something that I, I wanted to point out. Um, and so this is kind of the, uh, the significance path uh, as we call it, that we extract from this. Um, in reality, what our method does is it actually extracts a number of these different paths for a number of these topological features, and it connects them through time. It does so in a basically optimization, greedy kind of way, where we really prioritize connecting correctly uh, the most significant um, you know, one-dimensional feature. And so we don't think that what's really close to the diagonal here is, is very accurate necessarily and we don't use it. And then the other thing to note is that uh, oftentimes it's more useful to visualize a path like this, which kind of hides the dynamic aspect in this way, where we put time on the x-axis, and instead of the y-axis, we have the feature persistence. In other words, it's the death radius minus the birth radius. You might remember it as sort of the length of those bars in that barcode representation. And so the further away that this goes, basically from um, uh, the zero axis here, the more you have an emergent hole forming. Um, and so, but our motivation really came for, from trying to understand differences in these uh, myosin motor proteins. And so one of the things that Adriana has been able to see in the lab is that perhaps um, the differences in these two motors in the same myosin family stem from something in their head. And they did a domain head analysis, essentially. And so one of the things that we wanted to test is how much does the dynamics of this actin myosin network change uh, with different binding rates for the myosin motor. Um, and when I say small and large on rate here, these are really like 0.1 per second and 0.4 per second. They're really not that different. They're the same order of magnitude. But even those changes lead to very complete completely different kinds of organization. One that's really aligned at the boundaries here and one that's this contractile clumpy um, uh, cluster. And so uh, we wanted to uh, do a proof of concept with our method on these two kinds of simulations. Here, I'm only showing the last time point, but of course, we have data from all the different time points. And so you can see the two kind of paths that emerge from uh, these two for that most significant one dimensional hole in topological data analysis. Um, and of course, we have a stochastic model, right? And so um, uh, really, we would need to do multiple realization to convince ourselves that there's really a difference between these different binding rates. Um, and so to do so, we um, 
carried out you know, these 20 or 40, I believe, actually, simulations for each of the settings, and then um, got a sense of what, what is the timing uh, or onset of uh, ring channel formation, what is its persistence, which we defined it as the largest persistence over time. Um, and that's a little harder to do for these cases where you don't really have ring formation. You kind of have this up and down, but there's other things that you can keep track of. Um, and what I'm going to show you in the next slides is basically looking at the first sort of significant um, hole that you see in this path and compare them for these different binding rates of the molecular motor protein. Um, and so what you're seeing here, not surprisingly, is that for that small binding rate, you have um, a ring forming very early in, in the simulation, um, and you also have it be more persistent. Um, versus for the large binding rate, you kind of see this all over the place. There might be um, some rings forming, but they're certainly less persistent. Um, and so this, this just um, uh, validates what we have seen in one stochastic run. Um, uh, one of the interesting sort of math statistical questions that have, has come out of this is how does one really does establish significance? You might have noticed I had you know some dashed lines here where I'm thinking that that is maybe a threshold where everything above that is really the emergent of a global persistent a hole or ring channel as I interpreted it. Um, but how does one establish something like this? Um, and so it, it, what, what it what was interesting for us to find as we were studying this is that um, determining what is a significant uh, persistence levels in these topological summaries, like a persistent diagram, is still very much an open research area. Um, uh, oftentimes, it's, it's uh, uh, interpreted as distinguishing signal from noise. Um, and it, the idea is that where could we put basically a band or above this diagonal with slope one um, is to then interpret everything above it as signal and everything below as noise. Or you know, in our other representation, it would simply look like this. Um, there is some previous very rigorous theoretical work on constructing such confidence bands above the diagonal, but it's really applied for a very different setting. It's actually a different kind of simplex that they're using in persistent homology. Um, it's also that they're considering a static object with noisy observation around it, um, and uh, they're basically doing it, it by bootstrapping in a, in a persistent diagram. Um, all of this is not really our setting, um, and turns out not to really work for our setting either. Um, so to show you that, I'll, I'll give you an example of one simulation that we have of the actin myosin organization and um, the corresponding persistent diagram at different time points and the corresponding confidence band that this previous method gives for each of those time points. And you'll see that this really varies quite widely across time, which doesn't seem like should be right. It, it seems like we should have a confidence band throughout time for this kind of filamentous data that we're working on. So we proposed um, uh, a number of different ways to approach this. Um, one method would be to try to establish a null model. What would be the noise level in a persistent diagram for these um, uh, settings where we're just going to basically throw filaments in the same simulation domain at random, right? So their centers are going to be uh, basically uniformly um, uh, located at random in this domain, uh, and we're going to create multiple of these to get get a sense of what is the maximum persistence in, um, in such a null model. The other idea that we have exploited for determining significance is the fact that we had this database of large simulations. So we wanted to sort of get a sense of what is the distribution of persistences that one sees across these different simulations and across times. Um, and so in doing so, we, we actually have multiple of these. So you can kind of get a sense of how we actually get a lot of data um, to try to understand that distribution of persistence length. And what we do with that distribution of persistent length is we can represent it in a survival function kind of way. Um, and so that's what I'm showing you here. I'm basically calculating what is the probability that persistence, death minus birth of a topological feature, is greater than some persistence p that goes on the x-axis. So if p is 0, so if the persistent length is 0, then of course we're going to have all of the feature 1, right? So a fraction of 1 of all of the features um, being having a persistence larger than that value. But as we increase that persistent level, um, this curve is going to go down 
down as expected, but it also seems to have this sort of inflection here. Um, and so we have decided to basically put um, a conservative uh, sort of placement of this threshold somewhere past that inflection. That turned out to be a good choice also when combining this method with the null model that we just established, because if one adds the null model and the survival function corresponding to that, what one sees is, is a very different sort of situation. Um, and you can see how this departs from there. And the fact that we choose a threshold here is way beyond what might be a conservative threshold in the setting. This is something that we're still exploring. We find it kind of an interesting question um, uh, that hasn't been explored as much. Um, and finally, I wanted to say something about the sampling density that we use. Um, I had a, a visualization there where I showed that I would extract three points along an actin filament. In reality, we do a lot more than that, but we also wanted to see how does this change the results. Um, so you're seeing here um, these paths in persistent diagrams. Uh, excuse space. me, can I, can I ask a question? Oh, absolutely. Um, so all of this analysis is uh, for one particular simplex, right? So. Which one is it? And what about the other simplices? You mean what kind of uh, simplicial complexes we form? Exactly. Uh, it's the torus ribs in this case. And so why did you pick that? And why not other features? Well, the torus ribs is a good approximation of the Czech complex. Um, and it also seems to be one that one can get to computationally a little easier than others. So there's not really a lot more to it than that, to be honest with you. OK, thanks. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, so when it comes to the sampling density, what we noticed is that these paths seem to sort of converge as we increase that density of extracting points from the actin filaments to some paths. And um, it was sufficient to sort of use about 30% of the bead information that we had to get an accurate idea of the emergence of this um, global hole. All right, with that, I'll just tell you a little bit about future work. We're interested in understanding actin myosin organization in, say, cell cycle progression, where it can move from these patchy kind of organizations to homogeneous, to sort of bundles. Um, and so we want to understand specific, there's a lot of things that probably lead to that. There's probably, um, uh, upstream regulation of polymerization and other things like that, but we are focusing a little bit on understanding the role of the myosin motors. How might their regulation change this dynamic filament organization? So you're seeing here some examples of different step sizes of myosin motors and how they seem to lead to very different organizations. Um, one that's sort of homogeneously distributed, one with sort of two clusters and one with one sort of aster kind of cluster. And I will say all of these step sizes are very much in physiological ranges of actual myosin motors um, in uh, different families of myosin motors. Um, in, in current work, we're uh, sort of moving towards really understanding how two of these motor populations that might interact differently with actin uh, might generate actin organization. Um, and one piece that I didn't tell you much about is we have a little bit of information from the in vivo data that these two motors that seem to antagonize each other in C. elegans, um, they seem to segregate somewhat around the opening of that ring channel. And so we want to see if um, we can sort of get at the mechanistic uh, reason for that, what could be different between these motors um, to lead to such segregation. Um, and finally, in terms of actual experimental data, in vivo is really hard, but in vitro might be something we can get to. So we have a collaborator in biophysics at Willamette University um, who was able to extract this information about uh, actin filaments interacting with a different kind of myosin, an unconventional myosin called, called myosin 6 because it moves in the opposite direction. And so we hope to use some of this framework to understand those mechanisms of interaction. Finally, in terms of TDA, um, what we would like to do is we would like, and I'm going to do with some undergraduate students this summer, is to use a more rigorous distance metric between persistent diagrams at consecutive time points. Right now, we're sort of doing a greedy optimization where we're prioritizing that uh, most significant emergent holes, but we're interested in data sets that get more complicated, that you ha can have these multiple holes that are important to quantify or use as markers of a cytoskeleton organization. So, 
um, we're using, uh, we're planning to use more uh, rigorous distance metrics to establish those matchings. Um, and finally, what the ideal world, we would have really a different simplex choice that relates to the question before. Ideally, we would have a simplex that really grows um, around the whole filament. Because one thing that I do lose by sampling along the um, filament is information of which polymer structure did it come from in establishing, say, a ring channel or another structure. Um, and so that would be great. That seems to be a little harder, but it's something that I'm interested in in the future. With that, I'm just going to thank my sources of funding and you all for your attention. Well, thank you so much for such an interesting talk. Um, so now please feel free to ask Veronica questions if you have any. I had a question, maybe I can start. So yeah, one thing that I, I'm curious about is sort of the role of geometry, both from the perspective of whether, so you find these uh, one dimensional holes, as you said, but is there also some sense of the, the radius of these loops that you can extract? And is that something that um, mm -hmm. you're also interested in? And also, yeah. I, I'm also curious about, you mentioned that in the bio, biological context, these, uh, these ring filaments can be formed with a very uh, robust size. And that's part of what's important about them that they can kind of form with, with a specific radius. But in, your, in these agent-based simulations, it seems like that size is set more externally by just the size of the domain. So I'm also curious about what uh, you, you think about that and whether, you know, if you used a bigger box, would there be mm -hmm. some kind of natural size that comes out of this? Yeah, absolutely. So that's something they're still trying, they're still investigating in this computational lab that we're working with. What happens if you increase the domain size, is they're going to go further to what the domain boundary towards that larger domain size. Uh, yeah, that's and what it seems like. Is that that is what it is. Currently it's really set by the domain. And partly is because of the settings that we were using here, which were more proof of concept, where um, what actually one needs to do to have that not happen as much is one has to basically make these motors have more contractile power. And once you do that, that doesn't happen as much, that alignment at the boundary. So it had partly to do with us starting to understand the parameters of the system a little better. Um, but I agree, right now it was sort of artificially set by the domain boundaries. It's unclear in the biology either though, because there are also those membranes around the ring channels, they could also be setting some of that. So it's, it's a little bit unclear since we can't really see into it like that. But it would be great if it would if we had something that could select for a size. Um, the way we get at the size is we basically look at this largest persistence basically along the time of a simulation. That's kind of how we quantify how much it has opened for your first question. But yeah, that's a great question. So, so am I understanding correctly that Part of um, when you set this threshold in a way, probably part of what you're throwing out is maybe robust loops, but smaller ones. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yes, so that's maybe, why- Maybe that's inevitable. It, I guess, but I think there's something better to do still. Um, Cause yeah, basically we're throwing away this, uh, I think I had like this kind of stuff. Um, but you could imagine a simulation where you had sort of two holes forming or three holes forming and maybe they have similar persistent sizes. This algorithm probably would not be able to distinguish between them. However, um, if one uses something that's called the bottleneck distance or the Wasserstein distance between these persistent diagrams, that seems to be potentially a more promising way to do the matching uh, in that way instead of sort of an optimization kind of way. So that's that's the hope of getting some of the smaller features as well. Do we have any other questions for Veronica? I see like a chat thing, but maybe that was the question from before. I can't tell. Yeah, yeah that was the I question. think yeah. that's the okay. question from before. 
Well, yeah, maybe if there aren't any more questions, I have one more. So, Absolutely. Ask. so you, you mentioned this kind of biological mystery of you have these redundant myosin motors and, and turns out that uh, they're not redundant. They have almost opposing uh, effects. Do you, are you closer to understanding that? Do you have some hypothesis of what might be going on? Uh, we're not that much closer. Um, the The goal would be uh, that in Adriana Dawes' lab, they try to um, filter out some of these motor, motors sort of separately, right? So to get the myosin one and myosin two in vivo from, from in vivo, you know, organisms, that would be the goal. Um, so they've done some of that. The goal would then, then be to ship that out to the in vitro collaborator, biophysics collaborator, who can do these experiments on sliding assays um, with so far with myosin six, but why not with these two myosin two kind of families of motors? It turns out to be really difficult to get them to work in vitro in the way that they work in vivo. It needs, I mean, I guess the solution needs other things from the in vivo um, uh, environment that they're trying to figure out what exactly it is that it needs. Um, so that would be ideally the goal. But I guess it seems like you, you think step size could be one. Yeah, one we think step size, we think binding rate, we think um, about these things that have to do, or on binding rate, things that have to do with that um, motor domain um, uh, that, that they've analyzed and they've seen sort of some differences in, in the sequences. Um, but mechanistically, we don't know. Yeah, that's a question. Any other questions for Veronica? All right, then I guess we will just wrap up here for today. Um, I'd like to thank our speaker, Veronica, again, for such an interesting talk and everyone for participating. I will see you all next week. Thank you all for coming and good to see you thank all. You.